You know, the theme for this weekend, again, has been the theme of, of thriving, of flourishing as people. And when we moved down to Chilliwack, we uh, had lived in Penticton for six, five, six years and was working with Hart there. We moved down to Chilliwack in November, and it rained for like 14 days straight living out in Rosedale, and, and after 14 days, we were driving into the town, and we heard that there was a heavy rainfall warning, <laughs> and it was like, well, what have we just been experiencing for 14 days, and I, you know, when we started that song, here I am with the rain on my face, you know, and rain is one of those uh, images of God's blessing, right? The rain that falls on us. Uh, a picture of flourishing. And uh, another image uh, that uh, David made mention of is like messy mercy. If you're familiar with the uh, um, picture that God had given John Wimber, he's driving out in the desert and he gets this vision of this, these honeycombs of honey pouring down on people. And some people are just soaking up the honey, and others are like, like, get it off me, like pushing it away. Mercy is messy. God's grace is messy. And uh, about, we used to, we call this vineyard season three in our church because we, in season one, we used to meet across the street down where, uh, below where our kids are right now. And one day I got this really strange uh, phone call from the two guys that run a Harvest Cafe. They had a um, gift store underneath us. And they said, what are you guys doing up there? And it was like, we've got this sticky stuff all over the floor and we can't get rid of it. I'm going, what are you talking about? Like, we're not doing anything, you know, like this... Let me come down, I'll take a look, and came down to the first floor, and all on the wall, running out from the wall was this sticky stuff, and it was just like, oh, that's just weird, <laughs> you know, and you don't know what it is, right, is it, you know, and we, we, it was about two days, we were racking our brains, and, and then finally, I go upstairs directly above, and I hear this buzzing, and we pull off the uh, um, old drywall and all that, and there's these, these honeycombs that have been there where the bees managed to find their way in, and it had been over years been, been building honeycombs. And a lot of them were dead from previous years, and some were still alive, but there had been so much honey that it ran down the wall from the second floor. How much honey would that take? all the way down to the first floor, and then I was running out on the wall, I mean, on the floor, the ceiling. You know, it was just like messy mercy, right? God's grace, his desire that we would thrive and experience the, the uh, honey of his mercy, so to speak. So that really is our desire through this, this uh, weekend, together that we would would experience, and even in hearing our stories, that we would encourage one another towards uh, God's call in our lives. So uh, we're just trying to take each session and maybe just give you one little snippet from some of our different regions and different locales of different things. And it's all so different and, and varied as what God's doing in different places. So um, you might not have a honey on the floor story, but you do have a story. And so uh, Leslie, where are you? I'd love you to come and share a little bit of what God's doing in Penticton and, and just the story of, of how God is using the church there to experience thriving. Thank you. Um, in Penticton, I am the children's ministry leader, and I took on this, this position a year ago. And I have to give you a bit of a backstory to tell you the story. So in September, I started, and by October, I'd been invited on a pastor's trip to Costa Rica to deliver Operation Christmas Child boxes. Is everybody familiar with those little shoe boxes that you pack for children and they get sent around the world? Okay, so if you follow my news thread back and forth with this pastor group, I keep trying to talk them out of taking me because I'm not really a pastor. <laughs> and eventually, quite quickly, in a short time, I end up on this trip, and we get to do distributions of shoe boxes to children. 
And I didn't realize with that shoe box comes a gospel story before the children are given the box. They're told the gospel and they're given a little brochure of the gospel and they're invited to a 12-week program called The Greatest Journey. The Greatest Journey is a 12-week discipleship program where they're presented the gospel, they're given an opportunity to accept Jesus and they're taught how to share their faith. So while I was overseas, I was incredibly overwhelmed. Um, from Canada alone last year, 100,000 children were um, offered the opportunity to hear the gospel message. Now, recognize with those 100,000 children come parents and aunties and uncles and grandmas and caregivers and siblings. Just the way their culture is when these children are invited back for this 12-week journey, um, they're offered like nutrition and the whole family comes because they, they, they're hungry for real food and they get spiritual food as well. Um, very overwhelmed by this, I was asking the leadership, I was down there with the head fellas from Samaritan's Purse Canada, I'm like, how do we bring this home? And I think I was set up for this because they're like, well, we're really glad you asked. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> we want to domesticate the curriculum. They're like, how is it we see hundreds of thousands of children come to the Lord overseas and we're not feeling that here in Canada, we're not seeing it. So they had tried the year before, they'd had a church run a program and they wanted our church to be the second church in Canada pilot program to run the greatest journey at home. So they really worked with me and asked me how I thought we could do this. And what we did was similar to a vacation Bible school, but we called it the greatest journey. I'm like, hey, it's working over there. Let's just call it what we call it. So we called it the greatest journey and we invited children from our community in to our church for a four day camp. And the camp was called a rag bag soccer ball theme but the greatest journey was the overarching principle of it. So we were able to invite, we, we made space and our leaders were amazing to surround me in this. We had space to accommodate 50 children and think and feel that we could do a really good job. 41 children signed up and the day that we did, so we did the 12 day journey, 12 week journey, the four days during this one week camp. And then we invited the families to our church for a barbecue and a gathering where we could interact with them. And then our, our summer ministry carried on the next eight weeks. That was our kids' ministry for the next eight weeks. That would be our 12 weeks. Well, day four is the time that the children have the opportunity to accept, the, accept Jesus. They're told, like, this, this is the promise you've been given. This is the promise you can make. And we had a fantastic leader in our group. I don't know if he's been here before. Chad Wetter um, led the children amazingly in this. And 38 of the 41 children in the room accepted the Lord in, in, in a commitment that they signed their book saying, this is what I've done and this is what I want, and went to their leader and had their leader affirm them by signing and dating. Mm -hmm. So that was really wonderful. So we really saw the Lord work in that. I don't know the outcome yet in terms of the fruit. We're still inviting those families back into our church. The children made Operation Shoebox uh, packages that week and they're being invited two weeks from now to come and and present their boxes and pray for the children who will be receiving them so so we try to continue to have ways of inviting those families back the the eight weeks in kids ministry in the summer was an invite back and now we have the shoe boxes as an invite back so that's been really wonderful and I feel very blessed to have been a part of that and I want to share one more quick little story okay recently a leadership team at our church decided to do a be part, uh, do what was called a spiritual cafe. And there was this health fair being hosted in our hometown. And I, I had the opportunity to show up at the health fair to see where our church crew were. And when you walk in the room, it felt really odd and dark. And as I started to walk around the room, I told my older daughter to hold close to our younger daughter because I didn't understand what I was sensing. There was lots of dark spiritual things there, like stones and crystals and readings and cards being read for people's futures and things like this. And not knowing I was getting close to our group, I just had this peace wash over me. And I turn around thinking, okay, something's up. And here's our group set up and they've set up a spiritual cafe to pray for people, interpret dreams and for the prophetic. Mm -hmm. And they had the opportunity to have 55 people sign up and sit in a chair with them. And in that time period, nine people prayed to receive Christ. This is just an open community event that they saw a need, and they planned and prepared for this for a long time. They really planned and prepared for this. And so, again, we're not sure what the fruit of that is, but the opportunity was there, and it's just an awesome way we're seeing the Lord work in our community. You almost look like you wanted to add something. Awesome. Okay, great. So, so thank you. Thanks for asking.
A great story, absolutely. Of, and it's, it's going to look different in different places. Well, one of the things that, again, the, the um, imagery that have been using is this whole idea of the river and the desert and the city. Finding God in all three of those seasons in our lives when we're in those places. And, and Gordy just did just such an incredible job this morning of describing. And thank you for your just telling from your own story what it's like to be in those seasons. And Kathleen as well, just seeking out and finding God. And just, just amazing to hear what that looks like and, and, and feels like. And how we can, because we're all going to be in that season. And it's not something that we just need to resist. We say, okay, Lord, what do you have to say here? This afternoon, we're going to take the third of those um, pictures, which is the picture of the city. And uh, we're going to just, uh, uh, Carl is going to share first, and I'm going to finish and just talk about just some ideas around the city. And Carl, why don't you come on up? I want to introduce Carl. Carl is is just been this great guy that has Whenever we, we get an, an idea, I always, it's great to hear Carl's take on it because it's always, I'm not sure if it's coming out of left field, right field, a different field. It's just so interesting. I want you all to turn for a sec to, to look at that back picture of, um, this is a picture, something that Carl had in his mind about God being wireless. He is everywhere. And so with two of our artists, uh, my wife and and a lady by the name of Bon, who also did one, some of the First Nations art here, um, they drew up that poster, and I don't know if Carl's ever going to get it back, but um, we just this whole idea, and so I want to just pray for Carl, and just he's going to share some reflections on his just idea of what the city means in his journey, and, and so uh, if you would just uh, uh, pray with us here. Lord, I want to thank you for Carl. I want to thank you for the gift he is to us, I just ask, Lord, we, we say, speak now for, for, Lord, we want to hear what you have to say. Speak your servant, your servants are listening, Lord. And just speak through Carl, Lord, I just pray you give him boldness, clarity, and uh, Lord, just give us uh, the joy of hearing your life-giving word to us now, in Jesus' name, amen. First, uh, just before I start, truthfully, I just want to even just have a moment just to say thank you, like, for this family. I'm so thankful for Vineyard. Um, you guys have created space for a guy like me who doesn't always line up in the same box as everybody else, who tries to look at things from different perspectives. And, and not only have you guys created a space for me to belong, but you guys allow me to contribute, allow me to share, and embrace me along the way. So I just want to say thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so... For today, yeah, so they gave me the idea of the city, engagement, and uh, so I'm, I'm going to deviate slightly from the template that I was given, because originally it was, <laughs> it was uh, river, desert, city, and I'm going to kind of just walk all over it and, and, and even come from a different perspective. So, um, you know, forgive me, I'm, I'm, the rebelli I'm rebellious by nature, um, and truthfully, actually, we all are, if, you know, <laughs> my Augustinian fans in the house. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to speak from the perspective of like river, um, desert, and city. And, but I think that the desert serves two functions in this paradigm, right? The river is always a source of life. It's always God pouring into us. Um, but as we walk through the desert, we do it in two different ways. One, as people who are desperate for water. And two, as people who have deep reserves of water to offer others. Right? And the city is always a place of engagement. Um, and, and just something that as I was thinking through this, um, very visual thinker, was that the river, if it's been a place of being filled um, with living water, but the idea that if a river is diverted into a desert, it creates this great possibility for life. But if a river is diverted into a city, it's a great catastrophe, right? With untold death. And so I'm just gonna kind of speak from, from that perspective I'm going to share a couple different videos. Um, one of them is a little bit longer than I originally anticipated. But, and then just kind of talk through some ideas and just, uh, yeah, share with you guys. So uh, here's the first video. I'll just uh, move out the way. And this is from a guy named Chance the Rapper, by the way. And it's going to be like all over the map. So uh, if you get disoriented, I apologize. Sing with me, how great is 
I was lost in the jungle like Simba after the death of Mufasa. No hog, no meerkat. I cooled him a tide of my day, but I spent my nighttime fighting tears back. I prayed and prayed and left messages, but never got no hear back. Or so it seemed. A mustard seed was all I needed to sow a dream. I built the ark gently, gently. Blow my boat, I'm all the same. Sometimes the path I took to reach my petty goals was so insane. I was so far down the mud, could leave no let my light shine. But she was always there when I needed the phone. A friend and use her lifeline. From a lofty height, we waged war. The path of life to be sought to fight. Who was the angel that revelations with a foot on water and a foot on land? Who was the angel that wrote a holy from the pockets of the house of Said, this is uh, Chance the Rapper, who is arguably probably one of the most popular rappers out right now. And um, this is a quote from the Atlantic magazine, and they write this about the song. Um, In the middle of Chance the Rapper's new album, Coloring Book, right after a dance tune about drinking all night, and before a song called Smoke Break, a full gospel choir breaks out, How Great Is Our God, they proclaim, drawing from the immensely popular 2004 Chris Tomlin single. Right? And so this is not a Christian magazine. This is not Christianity Today. This is not Relevant Magazine. This is Atlantic, right? This is a world-renowned, definitely not Christian publication, pondering the implications of Chance the Rapper's song, right? And David Fitch, who is a theologian, says this, we live in a world that hungers for the Eucharist, the sweet fellowship that comes from between people in the presence of Christ, there are countless places where people gather seeking Eucharist, and yet it always remains unfulfilled. These places we must seek out and go as guests. Sorry, I was actually supposed to put that up for you guys, my bad. <laughs> um, right? And we all know the saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink, right? And herein lies the problem for, for most of us Christians, at least for myself, right, is that we have this water... And we're like, why won't you drink it, right? Moving from we have water to we have water, drink it now. And we end up with this conundrum where we know we have something good and we don't know how to deliver it all the time, right? And so it, and it boils down to, like for me, like when I talk about the, the gospel, right? And, and I ask the question, what is the gospel? And the answer is actually really simple, is that the gospel is good news, Right? The ancient Greek word, euangelion, that we use, to tra that we translate in our English Bibles as gospel, just means good news. Right? And, the, and we even translate, the word we translate now as gospel is actually a common Old English 
word that translates in contemporary English as good story. Right? And so we've gone from being good news to telling the good story to making the gospel a theological statement that most people can't actually talk about. Right? And so we as followers of Jesus, we know the gospel is the good story. We know that Jesus is the good story. We know this. Right? It's the best news in the world. And we want to share this with others. And we want them to experience this good news. We want them to experience this living water. We believe that this good news is actually really, 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 really good for them, right? And in our enthusiasm to share this good news, the good story with others, we begin to act in ways that are not so good news for some people, right? Sometimes in subtle ways, like lying invite, about inviting your neighbor to church. Um, no, 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 it's not a church service. It's a free concert, right? <laughs> like I was tricked into performing at a church service when I was younger, because they told me it was a concert to, to benefit youth, and it turned out to be a church service. And I'm like, why would you want us wrapping at your church service in the first place? But not, nonetheless, right? It's just like little things like that. <laughs> Back then, you wouldn't have, trust me. <laughs> uh, you know, and like, or very overt ways, truthfully, like yelling at people and shouting at them that they are damned. And, and, and apologize if I'm going to offend you with this, but not just damned. We actually use language. They are God damned, where he said, God is sending them there. And we yell this out a lot of times, right? And so I'm going to show you another video, and I apologize if anybody's triggered by it. It's, um, but it, I think it, 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 it illustrates what I'm talking about in a very, very vivid way. Um, so... So, the man in that video is the infamous atheist Christopher Hitchens, and he signed up to to to, to be waterboarded to show that it really was torture. And, and I thought this video was an apt representation of the ways in which we have taken living water sometimes and we turn it into causes of anguish for people. Here is a man, Christopher Hitchens, who grew up in a church and have walked away for whatever reasons, and instead of loving him back into community, we decided to debate him and make fun of him. On my way to Chilliwack yesterday, um, I saw a sign on the side of the road, big sign, it says, who is Jesus? And there in the picture was a Bible on the billboard. Right? And I drove down the road, slightly past the sign. I would say maybe even in the shadow of the sign, there was a group of men standing on the side of the road waiting for their ride after coming from laboring in the field. And when I saw these two images, the thing that just popped in my mind, are these men really asking, or are they even interested in the question, who is Jesus? Right? What would be life-giving? What would be good news to them in this moment? And how is God already present with this group of men? Probably a better question than who was Jesus in that moment. When I was pastoring in Surrey, there was a Korean couple that would stand on this one corner, kitty corner from each other across the street, and they would have these big sandwich boards over them, and it would say things like, Jesus saves, repent or go to hell, um, you know, Jesus is coming soon, uh, things like that. And the couple didn't actually speak any, 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 any English, right? But... They would hand out tracts faithfully. They would be there every single day faithfully. And, and, and they were desperate to see people reached for Jesus. And, and I remember I asked them once how many people they had seen come to Jesus through their efforts. And they'd been out there for years. Like I saw them for at least two years every single day on this corner handing out tracts with these signs on their back. They had come, and, and they had come from Korea as missionaries to be in Canada here. And, and I asked them, and, and, the, and the husband with a pained look on his face, and in broken English, said, no one. Now, I'm not trying to make fun of them, right? Like, so please hear, hear that. I'm not trying to make fun of anybody when I talk about that. 
or dismiss the courage and efforts that people like the Korean couple at great expense want to see people reach for Jesus. Billboards aren't cheap. The people who put it up want to see people reach for Jesus. Coming to Canada as missionaries from Korea is not easy, um, but both are forms of what I call evangelism. Right? It's basically we sit there and we, we put something up on a wall, we do something that we think is going to be really, really good, and it actually ends up being something that people think is a blight on their neighborhood. And I'm guilty of this too, right? Like it's, it's not just condemning other people. It's, 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 it's my own story as well, thinking that, okay, I'm going to reach people, what we call spiritual nomads, people who have walked away from the church. And, well, the best way to do that is to do a, maybe a more edgier worship service. And reality is nobody was interested to come in that. It was just another church thing happening in another neighborhood that they weren't interested in. Right. And it, it took having to, to run through that. And, and my heart is, I really want to see people come to Jesus. I really want to see people reconcile with Jesus. But I was doing the thing that I wanted to do that I thought was good news versus looking at what Jesus was already inviting us into. Right. Um, and, and, the other, and the reality is also is that I have all these outside expectations. Right. I'm connected to four different groups of people, different agencies that I have to report to that, that, are, that are looking for me to, quote unquote, be successful by a certain metric. Right. And so, so, Gordy, your words this morning, like they, they just cut me to the core when you said when you are trying to impress people, you cannot love them. Right. And, and that just that just cut me to my core, because here I am trying to impress my my bosses. I want my paycheck at the end of the day. Right. And, and I think a lot of us, we get caught up in even in, in the subtle ways of we don't critique what we do because our paycheck is dependent on doing that thing. And so I, I'm going to spoil it down to this. Engaging a city as good news is not dependent on my vision for what I think will be good, but rather it is dependent on what God, who is already present there, is doing and inviting us to participate in. I'm going to say that one more time. Engaging the city as good news is not dependent on my vision for what I think will be good, but rather it is dependent on what God, who is already present there, is doing and inviting us into to participate. Right. And so in not so subtle ways, as I said, we are like graffiti that marks a turf of a gang, right, that warns others to stay away. Um, it unfortunately does not invite people to explore Jesus in our culture. It actually serves to repel them away. It's like a torrent that washes people away. And it breaks my heart because I know the hearts of these people. I know the hearts of my own heart in this and that wants to desperately see people come to know Jesus. Wants to desperately share the life-giving water that is welling up inside of us. But we find ourselves being more like this, which is a picture of a gang's turf that says, do not enter, do not come into this neighborhood here, instead of offering people this, which is a local artist by the name of I Heart who does graffiti, and his whole point of doing street art is to provoke thought. His whole thing is to get people to explore, get people to reimagine, right? And instead of, you know, we offer people this instead of this. We offer people this instead of this. So I'm trying to operate two different things here, and they're not in sync. So, so um, and so I'm just going to just come to my last point here. Is this? I'm just going to play one more video clip. It's a video clip that if you were born in 1983 um, or before that, you may have seen it at some point. And so, yes. And I'm just going to point out that, yes, we'll, we'll watch the video. Is it me or is it like that? That looks like disgusting, right? Like, <laughs> I do not want to eat Lay's potato chips after that. <laughs> but no one can eat just one, right? 
And so we've all seen some version of the commercial before. My favorite over the years was the one with Mark Messier, like taunting his, uh, the other t- people on the team. Um, but the reality is that Lay's potato chips are subtly salty, right? The salt does two things. It makes you want to eat more, and it cultivates a thirst in the person eating them. And hence, since they're, pop- they're connected with, I think it's uh, Coca-Cola, you will then drink Coca-Cola, right? It's one of those things that goes hand in hand. And the thing is that Matthew 5 says this, you are the salt, is it up? Yeah. You, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. As followers of Jesus, as people formed in the image of Jesus, we are called to be salt and light in this world, right? Um, salt being the things that cultivate a thirst for the living water of Jesus, And light being the people who expose where God is already present and working in people's lives. Right? And so we want to be um, kind, I guess in a sense, Lay's potato chips, cultivating desire and thirst in people. We want to express, or sorry, when people express this thirst, that is the time to divert the river into their desert. Right? And I'm sorry for this one here. Any, Any DC Talk fans in the house here? Okay, well, unfortunately, we offer people this <laughs> when the world is inviting us into this. And the David Fitch quote one more time. We live in a world that hungers for the Eucharist, the sweet fellowship that comes between people in the presence of Christ. There are countless places where people gather seeking Eucharist, and yet it always remains unfulfilled. These places we must go and seek out and go as guests. And yeah, at the end of the day, I think that's what engagement in the city is about, is understanding that we are living, we, 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 we ourselves not just are poured into by this water, but we become this living water for other people. But at the same time, if we're not careful how we pour it out, we may actually devastate people instead of actually quench th- quenching thirst. So. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, so one, one of the things that we do is it's called the kitchen table. Um, it's, a, it's a creative night where we invite artists from the city to come collaborate together, to come share their, their gift with the community. And, and the main point is not to create necessarily another venue for somebody to perform, but to actually create community amongst artists. And in doing so, um, we create space, what I, I call relationships, that have the possibility to lead uh, to relationships with Jesus. And, and it's not that we're, we, like someone stands up and is necessarily, okay, here's the sermon. I'm going to cut into the, this is my own little set or something. Um, but through it, we have people in our community who are, who are followers of Christ, who, who are friends with the other people, like people in the community. And it's not some sort of a hidden agenda where I'm going to sneak up beside you because I want you to accept Jesus. It's the legitimate, I care about you, and you are part of my family. You are part of my community. We, we, we share this life together. And we're starting to see people... Um, there's one guy in particular that I'm thinking in our community who comes from a certain background where he kind of new age spiritualism, kind of smorgasbord faith idea where he's starting to ask some really pointed question. And it's not anything that like somebody's preaching at him necessarily. It's coming through a friendship with another person in the community, someone who's just loving him and connecting with him and walking with him and just challenging things in a, in a, in a way that friends would challenge each other over, over coffee kind of thing. So that, that's just one of the areas where I would say like there's saltiness being, because he's asking questions and people are just ask, they're just giving answers that, 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 are, that are cultivating more thirst in him. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I think it's really important to try to understand, um, but I, I, unfortunately, I don't think we can really walk in other people's cultural experiences. We are always going to be an outsider, and I think sometimes we can even do damage when we try to assume that we can walk in their shoes. Um, even the way that we talk about other cultures, as if I can acclimate it and become part of it, um, I can be an invited guest into it, right? Again, like the Eucharist 
is, is being sought, I think, and people are seeking the Eucharist, and we can be invited in as guests, but we also we want to make sure that we don't usurp the table. Like, we are a, a guest at their table. Yeah. So, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay. Cool. Yeah. You know, one of the pictures memories that I'm going to have of this weekend is probably the best picture I um, heard to address what you were talking about, Carl, was the story of the young girl who went from her activity in her school and joined the young Syrian girl and was with her in her space with what she needed at that time. At, at personal cost. And the children will lead them. I'm thinking, what more of a powerful picture of what it really means to be um, bringing Christ into a situation. That, that was just worth you know, a thousand words. It just uh, it really stuck with me. Well, I, unlike Carl, I never grew up in the city. Um, I grew up in a small town Got a picture of my small town. Small town I grew up in, you wanna flip one over there, Leith? Was the town of Creston, BC. Anyone been to Creston? In my town, we fought over whether or not we should allow, we knew things were going downhill when we allowed traffic lights in town. Creston, to this day, never changes its clocks, ever. That's just some newfangled European idea, probably like roundabouts. <laughs> you don't need them. So Creston will not be changing their clocks this weekend, but the rest of you get an extra hour of sleep, just letting you know. To this day, Creston still does not chlorinate their water because who needs that? They have a great bakery. I grew up outside of Creston in a small town. So I wasn't even in Creston. Those were town boys. I grew up in a small farm outside of a small town on a, a cattle farm. But I remember going to the city. I remember as a young boy in the back of our old car going to the big city of Spokane, Washington. And I remember looking out the back of the window of that car, being just the feeling of excitement in being in the city, but feeling completely overwhelmed. I think it was Sprague Avenue. It felt like it never ended. It went on and on and on. This town, we were driving for the longest time, and we were still in the city. As a young child, it was completely overwhelming to me. And um, when I apply those same images to living in the city and attempting to minister in the city, I have those same two feelings, the feeling of being excited and the feeling of being overwhelmed. Because you see, the city is a place, we'll go back to that, that picture again of the city, the city is a place of bustling activity. It's this place of crowds, right? Jesus knew all about the city. If you go over to Matthew 15, uh, let me just read you a city verse. A vast crowd, it said, brought to him people who were lame, blind, crippled, those who couldn't speak, and many others. They laid them before Jesus, and he healed them all. The crowd was amazed. Those who hadn't been able to speak were talking. The crippled were made well. The lame were walking, and the blind could see again. And they praised the God of Israel. The city is a place of lines. It's busy. It's active. It's a place of 
opportunity. If you want the biggest opportunity, you go to the city. The city can be a place of success and accomplishment. It includes ministry as well. And it wasn't just Jesus that experienced the city. His followers experienced the city as well. Let me read you a city verse from one of Jesus' followers. And uh, it's about Paul. Listen to this. Is this a city verse or what? So a time was set, and on that day, a large number of people came to Paul's lodging. He explained and testified about the kingdom of God and tried to persuade them about Jesus from the scriptures. Using the law of Moses and the books of the prophet, he spoke to them from morning until evening. The energy. How many people were coming to him? A large number of people. That was a place of ministry success and public profile, a sense of accomplishment. And all those are true of the city, aren't they? But what is also true of the city? The city also has its dark places, doesn't it? You know, the sections of town where you're not supposed to go after dark. You don't want to get lost there. And if you're heading there, it's probably not for a good reason. Those parts are also true of the city. And when it comes to ministry, and you're in a season of the city, it seems at times that the opportunity to minister they come faster and greater than your capability over a period of time. And what happens is, as we've heard about and discussed here, fatigue begins to set in, brownout becomes burnout. What used to thrill us now overwhelms us. Uh, healthcare professionals use a different term than burnout. They substitute the words compassion fatigue. You just can't find it in you to care anymore. You just don't care. You'd like to care, but it ain't there. And you can't find it. It's gone somewhere. We just celebrated our 20th birthday here um, a couple months ago. Uh, 20th birthday, and, and um, when we planted the church, I had um, left Penticton. I was on staff there. Me and my wife moved down. Tom and Teresa joined us uh, shortly after. And uh, I was fortunate that... Uh, both me and my wife are teachers, so she's an elementary special ed teacher. I'm a high school teacher. And we, for about seven years, we did um, homeschooling, which was one crazy idea. Um, but we just felt we were called to that, which you need to be. And we also, I was teaching um, at times five days a week substitute teaching and full-time pastoring preparing sermons, and uh, at times I would take teaching courses like if, you know, teach full-time like a Math 10 course or computers or something, and did that for seven years and then hit a wall, total, complete wall. I call it my perfect storm. I had an intersection of burnout. And on top of that, you know, if you've ever seen the show Perfect Storm with uh, that good-looking guy that's my age, uh, George Clooney, there you go, George Clooney, <laughs> whose birthday happens to be on my birthday as well, November. Um, so um, anyways, um, he... Uh, twins. twins, thank you, thank you. 
three, three storms converged in that movie. And for me, it was burnout. It was also the year, I was 41, that my father had left my mother and began a series of affairs. And the breakup of my parents' marriage was part of that and dealing with that. And enter stage left, uh, a, a new battle, um, an old battle, but had been inflamed by high-speed internet. So you can add that together and figure out what that was when you're working alone in the office. So those three things became my perfect storm. And you go, what is happening? I obviously need to walk away from ministry. Now, I was in a very unique situation. Um, I happened to, we had a church that um, allowed for brokenness. I had a wife that allowed for brokenness and managed to find some help to take what was a, I like in my life that you know how you take a top and you spin it? At the very beginning, it has a really tight spin. It looks like it could go on forever. But near the end, it hits this huge wobble. How can you take a, a, a top and somehow get it to spin properly again? Sometimes you just have to go stop it on and, and, and recalibrate the whole thing. So this has been a part of my journey and has been continued a part. And there's, there's relapses at every level of those three storms in, in my life. And so how do you continue to find an, uh, a sustainable way to move forward in life and ministry? One of the most, I find it almost a mocking verse, just being honest with you, is Romans 12, 11. Listen to this verse. Never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Doesn't that feel uh, rather unsustainable? I'm just throwing it out there. And uh, so, so one of the struggles in long-term ministry in the city is what I've described as fatigue at some level, compassion deficit. There's, you know, heard the quote before, fatigue makes cowards of us all, right? Uh, a second um, equally, and I think an even more insidious peril of the city is not burnout, but is bitterness. Um, Attempting to minister to people sounds like those old top 40 shows on Saturday morning. And the hits just keep on coming, you know, and hit after hit after hit after hit. Well, that's great on a top 40 radio station, but it feels that way in ministry. You have lost friendships, strained relationships, the same people who look for unconditional acceptance and affirmation from you, for them, leave under the slightest provocation. Seeing people who are excited about their relationship and serving in the church walk away from the church at times walk away from their marriages and or walk away from their faith. Numbers of uh, people that I've ministered to don't even believe in God anymore. And it's in these places that bitterness seeks to grow. We had a great talk at lunch with Rose and Rich just how do you guys do it? We asked them. Some of the comments, I remember one comment from one elder as we were seeking to make um, sense of uh, another couple who had left the church. 
they said, it's really funny because it's like the people that the church comes around the most and it helps in the greatest way. They're always the one to leave. What's that about, he said. We didn't have any great answer for him. Another friend of mine, you know, bitterness, you know, um, he has this great fra phrase, and um, it's not a very godly phrase, but it summed up where he was at. And, he, you know, his phrase was, no good deed goes reward. No, no, no. No good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> and then, you know, okay, Somebody told me there was a, a, a mushroom growing in the, uh, this thing here. I guess it is. I, mushrooms begin to grow. Fungus begins to grow in our hearts. There are dark places in the city, and they're only a few blocks away from the sections of town with the brightest lights, aren't they? They're very close. There is a high-cost to live in the city, to work in the city, and to minister in the city. And I'm not just talking about the cost of housing. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> and so the question is, how is it possible to live in the city? And we've been coming at this. This morning was a great part of uh, seeking to... Um, maybe come at this in some ways, how is it possible to live in the city for any sustained period of time without ending up in burnout or bitterness or just being bad? How is that even possible? You know, I, I was thinking how many years we went to these fall conferences starting way back in Cedar Springs Heart. You used to invite us down there when that's like 25, 30 years or more. And, and the stories you, you think back of, of the cost of people attempting to minister in the city. And, and, and I don't have all the answers. I'm only going to give you one or two that have been helpful for me in uh, the 25 years of of, of ministering here. These are my fail-safes, my um, bedrock, I guess, in terms of what helps me. They may or may not um, give you solace or, or strength. Here's the first one. Remember who you are serving. It makes a world of difference who you are serving first and foremost. It makes all the difference in the world. Here's a common passage, for example, out of Colossians 3. It says this. Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you are working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and that the master you are serving is Christ. Who are you serving first and foremost? You are serving the Lord. What does that mean? How does that actually make a difference if you have that perspective? Here's the first thing. If I am serving the Lord first and foremost, then I am first and foremost asked to please the Lord and do what he asks me to do. And that is not the same as meeting every need which is presented to me or is requested of me to meet. If you are serving the Lord first and foremost, you will be bent to them and you will eventually end up burnt out, angry, or bitter if that is the first and foremost group that you are serving. I remember one well-known speaker, I won't say their name, was, uh, made this comment, and my, my wife was in the middle of a horrendous burnout at the time, and she just, I never want to listen to that person ever again. I will burn every tape they ever made. So she was feeling rather 
impassioned about this. Here was the statement. If you see a need, it is your job to meet it. Oh, yeah. oh my goodness. Remember you remember that one, do you? Yeah. My wife, who walks into a room and sees every flippin' need, how do you survive? Now, I can be blissfully unaware of most needs. <laughs> and so it helps, you know, we balance each other. But can you imagine what death that is to somebody to live under that? You know, fortunately in the vineyard, we attempt to follow this idea of doing what the Father's doing. And that means asking the Lord, Lord, is this my need that you are calling me to join your hand to in. Not out of a broken need to be needed or whatever, or this, this um, challenge around, I'm feeling guilty now because I didn't meet that need. And, you know, who's the voice of guilt? It's usually the enemy just causing us to, to wash my whole body, Lord, right? Because we just have to overdo everything. Here's another one. To be a servant leader, for example, now this is moving into to, um, the whole realm of leadership. To be a servant leader is not necessarily to do what everybody wants. Because as a leader, who are you first and foremost serving? The Lord. Jesus practiced that all the time. They move into town like Creston or somewhere else, they set up their camps, things are, you know, they start a couple nights and things, and then just when things start really hitting momentum, what does Jesus say? It's time for us to move on. And they're infuriated. They're going, this was going great, and now you're going to ruin it and go to another town where we're starting over again. And Jesus is saying, guys, I know you're agitated, but first and foremost, I am serving my father and he's saying, move on. And that's really important. I remember when I moved down here, somebody had taken the verse of, uh, um, had, had moved so far away in the leadership continuum where, where his job was basically, this, the, the leader's job and his understanding was simply to serve everybody by doing what everybody wanted and never to say no and just say yes to everything. That's what a servant leader did. They don't lord it over people, they just... Do what everybody wants. And I was just going, wow. You know, even Jesus didn't do that. <laughs> Absolutely, as a leader, listen, remain humble, accountable, but follow the Lord first and foremost. Probably the one verse which has been my ultimate bedrock in ministry for 25 years. This came about, I don't know, about 10 years ago when I was really getting wobbly. Um, was that phrase where Jesus asked uh, Peter, um, Peter, do you love me? Now, we, of course, often remember that um, it, it, it mirrored the three times that, that Peter denied Jesus. But for me, there was a whole different application, a centering application to that, where Peter says, or Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes. And then Jesus says, then feed my sheep. He asks him again. And I, I, I know one of the other two I, I, um, was take care of my lambs. Feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Peter, do you love me? If you love me, Peter, this is what it looks like. And so we say, okay, so why has that been so pivotal to you? This is why. When sheep bite, and they do, or somebody you are serving responds in an ungrateful way or says, I'm out of here, you remind yourself 
Who am I serving? I am serving first and foremost the Lord. I, it really never was about you anyways. Well, yeah, it was, but it kind of wasn't. You know, our church now, uh, 20 years later, is like completely different. It's been like 12 churches. Maybe that says something about how hard it is to get along with me, but, but, but it is. And the hits just keep on coming. But the point is, it's not about, it, it's about the people, but it's not first and foremost about the people. Do you understand what I'm saying? And when people say, you know, you know um, uh, in Nebuchadnezzar, the writing on the wall, um, many, many Tekel Parsons, I think it was, um, if I got that uh, Assyrian script right. Um, what it was essentially God telling Nebuchadnezzar, you have been measured in the scale and found wanting. Do you know how often as a leader you were a meanie, meanie, tekel parsoned? <laughs> All the time. Every week, every relationship, every, you know, it's like thumbs up, thumbs down. <laughs> Facebook posts, you know, like that, don't like that. No, I, I, you might say, I'm, you know, boy, you need to go back to counseling. I'm just telling you like it is, because it's an incredibly competitive, maybe it's not in your town, we've got 70, 80 churches here. It is, this is a competitive consumer church marketplace. Meany, meany, tackle Parsons. And it works that way relationally anyways, Right? So what do you do when that happens? And you have that meeting with somebody and they say, you know, we feel God's calling us somewhere else. We don't really want to talk about why or we do or whatever, you know. And you just go oftentimes to yourself. I don't say this to people because it, you know, that time it's, they've already made conclusions that it doesn't really going to play out well. But it's kind of like to myself and to my wife, it's not really about them in the end. It's about Vern. Do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Yes, Lord. Vern, do you love me? And take care of my lambs. All right? Second thing that has been helpful is just this thing, and this one comes with its own question, is, is serving from a heart of love. Now, within that, you say, okay, well, it sounds like that's not a, it's a tenuous thing, but let me just share the previous verse to that, never be lacking in zeal verse, because it gives some context here. Romans 12, 9 to 11. Love must be sincere. Don't fake it. <laughs> Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And I know, I know if I treasure, I, I serve the people that I love and treasure. I know that. So I know if I could somehow get to that verse, the devoted one another in brotherly love and sincere love for people, if, if I could get there, it's going to make my job a whole lot easier. Do we all agree with that? If you really love sincerely from the heart, it's going to make a job of, of caring and loving. I don't care what, this is not about whether you're a pastor or not. This is just about loving people, your neighbors, people you work with. If you really love them, it's going to be a lot easier. I mean, think about as parents what we do for the kids we treasure. You know, we, ch we change their dirty diapers. It doesn't seem to bother us. We get up in the middle of the night. When the kids get older, we go and stand and watch their practices in the pouring rain. When do we ever stand out in the pouring rain for anything? There are kids, we treasure them. You know, and now my kids are, are such age where I say to them, you know, they go, you know, my youngest son goes to a party and, and I say to him, dude, if you have anything to drink, if you're in pro, if you have something and you need to, I don't care what time of the night it is, you call me. I will get up, I will drive, I will drive, you know. Is that what we do for our kids? Absolutely. Because we treasure them. We serve those we treasure. 
And so we say, okay, Lord, if, if I'm going to do this long term, in my heart, I've got to find that ability to treasure people and love people. I'm not advocating for my previous conference that, we, that we, we should not aim to love people. But how do we get there? How do we get there? Some days it's easier. Some seasons it's easier. When we hit compassion fatigue, it's almost impossible at times. And so we go back to our opening images. I would just say we have to start by returning to the river. We got to go back to the river. I have to go back to this place where I remember, and I do remember, God saying to me, Vern, I love you. You are my son. With you, I am well pleased. Atta boy. I got to get back in the river in, my, in, in the place in my life. And when I get back there, it's like, oh. It just like begins to fill me up again with the Father's love. And if I get filled up again in the Father's love and in the river, it begins to, to the very bottom of the well, water starts appearing again. And if it's just dusty, dry at the bottom of the well, I, just, I have to find that place again, back to the river. And I have had a couple experiences where my, being raised by my father, my father was a workaholic, uh, was total performance oriented with my dad. I never, he never told me he loved me. He never gave me those kind of affirmations, which are so much more normal part of parent-children interactions today, or at least should be. The only time I ever had a relationship with my dad was when I worked with him. And I remember um, in Penticton Vineyard as a part of my journey, first couple of years were just getting healed up from that, which was good before I ever attempted to do ministry. I remember Ron Bentham praying for me one Sunday morning because I, I, as a young child, um, uh, we all had to go out and pick rock. We, we cleared all the trees. We picked the rock. We did everything from, we took wooded area and turned it into hay fields. That's what we did. And at four years of age, I was expected to go out and pick rocks from the hay field with my older brothers and sisters. And I remember one day, um, dad paying everybody by the hour, but he had been counting the, the number of pails I had picked. And, and he just figured, you know, you, did, you, you were kind of aimless. You kind of you kind of were not really focused. So I'm going to pay you just based on the number of pails that, uh, that, of rocks that you picked. And that kind of embedded itself in my spirit at a young age. I remember Ron praying for me in Penticton, and it was just this whole thing. Vern, you, God's saying through him, you don't have to pick a rock for me anymore. You are my son, whom I love. I am delighted in you. And as Gordy pointed out, it's before Jesus did anything. And I have to return to that place to try to find uh, that love again. I really wish I could have found it, this picture for you. I'm still trying to get it. There is a place in Creston called The Point. It is a place of refreshment. It's, it's this place in Goat River. I, actually, I don't have the picture, Leith. Uh, it's this place in Goat River it's about 30 feet deep, and it's got all these cliffs, and you can jump into these 30-foot beautiful pool. It's called The Point. And I used to work when I was at UBC. Every summer, I worked at the sawmill on the green chain. At the end of every day, we would be longing to go to The Point. And you had to go down this super long climbing thing, you know, to get down there. But you were just longing Usually July and August, because the rest of the year was just, you know, the, you, know, you know how rivers are in B.C. Normally, just you'd freeze, you know, totally. But July and August, that's when I would be there. And you just could not wait to dive into the point, the pool there. And it would just take away everything. It'd be like, oh, all of, there's nothing like, the pools just don't do it. Like a crystal clear river. And so it's like, oh, man. I heard just two years ago, it infuriated me that some guy had bought the property 
some anal type something. He bought the property and he fenced off the path to get down to the point. That is dastardly. (laughs) Why would you do that? You robbed me of my childhood. But it's like what you write is, is the ability to go and get refreshed. I get, you have to go all the way down the river now. It's just really hard now. But, but I guess that's an imager where I just go, Lord, how do we do this thing? Number one is we, just, we, we have to regularly get back to the river. And when we're in the season of the city and, you know, we just have to keep saying, Lord, I love you. This is my service for you. Fill me with your love again in this place. That's what, those are a couple things that have meant something to me in my journey, in my life. When I get too far away from the river, then I start taking shortcuts. I start doing those things. So let's, uh, let's stand up. I want to I just pray for us here. We, we can have uh, the worship people go out. Susan, you, yeah, you want to come? Pierce well. Lord, I ask right now by your spirit that you would come. You would come to us in our place right now, Lord, of dryness or fatigue and especially bitterness. There's this phrase in 2 Timothy, and and I, I know the Bible doesn't say that, but it says it to me every time I read it. It says, and the Lord's servant must not quarrel. But every time I read it, it, it reads to me, and the Lord's servant must not be bitter. And if you're in that place today, I just want to say, Lord, right now, we just invite you to come. 